We are live. Hey, good morning. Good morning. It's uh, Jack Kelly. Let's go live with Jack Kelly. And today, um, we're going to talk about millionaires. Yeah, millionaires. Um, what made me think of it, I saw a, a thread on Twitter or X, uh, you know, looking into about millionaires, what it takes to be a millionaire, how much money do you need to uh, how much money you need to have to be a millionaire so i thought hey let, let's talk about it um i don't know about you but oftentimes growing up it was very odd or weird or considered impolite to talk about money and so uh, oftentimes you you wouldn't know how much your friends were making or your friends parents were making um well, where I grew up, they really weren't making much. I, I grew up in a very, very low, lower socioeconomic area. So no one was really making any money. So that 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 part wasn't so important. But it's one of those things where it's it's kind of taboo-ish to talk about compensation, salary, you know, net worth. But I think by talking about these things, it opens it up for more clarity more transparency and getting a sense of what's really going on. So for instance, you know, did a little bit of a deep dive to look into and figure out, Hey, what, what's, you know, like, what does it take to be a millionaire? How hard is it? How many people are millionaires? And I don't know why that millionaire has like a certain benchmark, you know, it's like for many people who are maybe Gen Xers or boomers, you were looking when you started earning money, you were thinking, hey, I want to get a hundred thousand dollar salary. And if I get a hundred thousand dollar salary, I made it. Now, in today's day and age, with inflation, I'd imagine maybe 250, 250K is probably something that you're needed to say, hey, I'm comfortable. This is okay. Um, maybe that's not even enough. When you factor in inflation, all the high costs, I'm not really sure what you need. I think for most people. They're, we're struggling. Uh, now let's get back to to. It's really interesting. So some of the I'm going to look away at some of my notes here because I want to get it right. Because a lot of numbers, I'm 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 not that great with being a numbers guy. So check this out. As of as of now, right? As of now, and maybe take a guess on your own to see 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 what you think. What do you think? How many people are millionaires? in the US. Give you do 25.58 million Americans are have a net worth exceeding 1 million dollars. It's pretty that's that's more than a quarter, a little bit more than a quarter of the population. And what they're talking about not household but individual, individuals who are millionaires. So that seems a lot, doesn't it? I think in part, there should be kind of a little bit of an asterisk. There should be a little bit of an asterisk in that a lot of uh, the millionaires, their wealth is from their homes. So if let's say you were a baby boomer, and you bought a house in the 50s or 60s or 70s, you, you may have paid you know, $15,000, $20,000, $30,000 for a home. And now that house could easily, if you're, let's say, in the suburbs of New Jersey, Connecticut, Los Angeles, some of these you know, high-end suburbs, not even high-end, some of these you know, just nicer suburbs, let's take that as an example, the odds are if if you were a boomer and bought that home, you know, 50, 60, 70s, you're probably sitting on a million plus. So right away, you're a millionaire. And this is where things get sticky because just because you have a home and you're worth a million dollars or or the house is a million dollar plus, it it's it doesn't necessarily mean you're a millionaire because you don't know. In addition, 
Do you have income coming in, not income? What are your liabilities? So what happens too, when you think about millionaires, you have to factor in not only your net worth and your home price, but what are your liabilities? Do you have credit card debt? Do you have student debt? Do you have loans on cars? Do you have mortgages with you know, a summer home? Are, there, you know, are you paying off your kids' college tuition? So that you have to factor in your money, but then take away all your liabilities to, to see what it's really like. But about this, rep, it's, it's so crazy how, how this is. So the numbers keep going up. Because with the stock market rising, real estate rising, you're seeing much more millionaires. Um, and, and, and as I was saying, like, it's to, for the net worth, it's the value of all your holdings minus your liabilities. And wow, to enter to, to, to uh, would you believe that another thing that in New Jersey, they are the most millionaires in New Jersey. And I know a lot of the people are in the tri-state area who are watching this and a lot in New Jersey. So, so I don't know if this comes as a surprise that New Jersey has one of the highest rates of millionaires. Um, it, and, and I think a large part is that the real estate prices of New Jersey are super high. And I bet you a big chunk of that is due to it. Chris, did you, did you, were you aware that New Jersey is home to the most millionaires in the U.S.? Yep, it says nearly 10% of households have a net worth of over 1 million or above in New Jersey. That means 250,000 New Jerseyans are millionaires. Yeah. And I, I like to point out, I, I'm, I'm a native New Yorker, spent most of my life in New York, and New Yorkers always kind of looked, looked down a little bit at New Jersey, you know, stuck their nose up like, oh, we're New Yorkers, we're not New Jersey. But 250,000 New Jerseyans are millionaires. That's a that's, big number. That's a lot for being the armpit of the U.S. <laughs> wait, wait, who calls it the armpit? That's so everyone, horrible. Everyone calls us the armpit of the U.S. I, okay, all right. Let's deviate a little bit. I got to tell you, I wasn't bored. And I've been in New Jersey 10, no, 10, 15 years since we moved out of you know Manhattan. And... I got to tell you, driving all around New Jersey, it defies, it defies the myths about it. I got to tell you, there's so, it's so not, there's so many nice places. There's such greenery. They call it the Garden State. And I didn't know, like, why do you call it Garden State when I first moved there? But it gets, it's all green. I mean, there are a few cities that aren't so great, but if you go around, it's beautiful. It's lovely. It, it, and people take it for granted. So I, I get a, I'm going to push back on that, Chris. I'm not going to say. <laughs> Even though I know you're a you're you're a native New Jerseyan, I I think it's a lovely lovely state. Yeah, I think they're just judging us on like Sea Caucus, New Jersey. <laughs> Even Sea Caucus isn't that bad. You have the Maryland <laughs> Stadium, right? You have a football stadium for goodness sakes. That's pretty cool. I I road trip the U.S. and I remember driving back in through New Jersey, and I was like, oh yeah, this is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? For people who aren't aware, if you come into Jersey, oftentimes there's this like, like I don't know, what are they? Factories or oil producers or whatever? Yeah. And there's like few, you know, like plumes of smoke constantly belching out of these places. So yeah, I could see if you're coming into a certain area, you're like, oh my God, this is this is terrible. But yeah. there are other places that are super nice. Yeah. So, okay. Would you guess, what do you think like the primary areas that people made their money to be a millionaire um you mean like real estate or invest? yes check real estate because yeah. they say real estate's about 40 percent of a mm -hmm. typical millionaire's net worth and then in uh investing check yep uh and then just being self-made mm -hmm. like entrepreneurship mm -hmm. see that's the biggest thing you know, real estate again, like we were talking about, I think a lot of it is if you bought a house early and and the price is appreciated so much, you did really well. Um, if you invest in the stock market and held over time, you do really well. And I would have thought that a lot of the money was from inheritance, but it seems like that was only a small part, like 2%, right? Chris, it wasn't a huge number 
that yeah. people became millionaires because of just take, handing over your, you know, from the parents or grandparents. Yeah, 2% inherited their wealth from their families. 80% of surveyed millionaires grew up in families at or below middle middle income levels. Which to me, that's like the best thing ever, right? Because it shows that the American dream is still is still working. It's a, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a little broken. It's not as strong as it was. But to show that you have these millionaires who came from you know, lower from middle, lower middle class, working class, it shows that th that's, that's, it's possible. And I think that's good news to hear. So when people feel like, oh no, I'm never going to make any money. I'm never going to get ahead. It shows that, yeah, you can. And that's, that's pretty positive. So this is not like a theory. This is not like the rah, rah. Oh yeah. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps. You could do it. This is quantifiable. Like, Hey, yeah, this this certain cohort that were you know middle lower middle class working class were able to become millionaires, which is which is really nice to see. Yeah, Tim Corley, he's a wealth expert, and he kind of studied millionaires, their habits, and how they think. Mm -hmm. And his research showed that twenty percent of millionaires made their first million in their mid to late thirties, despite having middle class incomes, and that's with just like saving money and investing about 20% of their income. And then also around 20% of millionaires rolled the dice. So they engaged in high risk, high reward pursuits. Those are the people who became like athletes, musicians, entrepreneurs, or actors. And then more than 30% took like the traditional route mm -hmm. where they climbed the corporate ladder and made their way to the C-suite. And these executives earn about like 3.4 million after 22 years. It's so interesting how it goes across from, from CEOs, C-suiteers, athletes, musicians, mm -hmm. uh, people who just entrepreneurs hit it right, you know, or, or you know, just kind of finding the right business to open and run. So, so this, it's not like one thing, right? I mean, it comes from a bunch of different areas. Yeah. And for the net worth, what do you think? you need to be to be like in the in the top one percent or so mm, was it 11 million you i you know i hear a couple of different you know i see a couple of different things so like charles schwab says that the individual net worth of 2.2 well this is not the one percent but 2.2 million makes you considered wealthy now i don't know what do you think is 2.2 million wealthy or I, is that is that like just just getting by I feel like that's just getting by because it's interesting because you talked about how like to now probably like 250k is the benchmark for just like living mm -hmm. comfortably, but more than a third of Americans who earn around 250k and nearly say they're living paycheck to paycheck. So you that know, and it makes mm -hmm. sense. Like I saw something Ben Mena who was on our show, um, he gave a breakdown of what it's like, what you need for the American dream. And I'm going to paraphrase, I don't have it in front of me, but it was something like $3.8 million. And he gave this kind of list of, you know, home prices, educating your kids, uh, you know, rent to so mortgages and so forth. And the time you go through everything, <laughs> pet care, it's not a lot. It's, it's, and that's, that's a scary thing though, where because of high inflation and high interest rates and, and all the costs going up. You, you need to make a lot of money, right? I mean, like you, if you don't, you're falling behind. Yeah, 60% of people in the US are living paycheck to paycheck. And then I, the other day you had asked me about how many people would like with the savings, nearly mm -hmm. one in three have emergency savings, but not enough to cover three months of expenses. And to make matters worse, 22% of US adults have zero emergency savings. So how, gosh, so what the heck, how does that work for people who, you know, to go to McDonald's, I want to say, I just saw something where French fries were $17, but then I think it was like a little bit of a hoax that the large fries were really, it was like delivered by DoorDash or something. So when you factored in the price of the fries, but then the delivery and the tip, it's, it's like $17. But then also I saw for McDonald's for what everybody growing up, we all, you know, if we went, you know, with a family to McDonald's, it was going there because it was a cheap way to eat. 
and I don't know, maybe be $10, $12. I don't, I don't remember for a family. Depends on how old you are when, you know, I haven't eaten McDonald's for a long time because my kids are older. When they were little kids, they wanted the Happy Meals, so we would take them there. But when they got older, I haven't been to McDonald's forever. But the price points were pretty low. Now it's pretty hot. So even if you want to get McDonald's, it's not cheap. It probably walk out like $20, $30 for a family. Am I, am, I, am I wrong about that, Chris? Yeah, it's just expensive just to live. And they, they have a joke that like going outside costs a lot of money. You spend <laughs> it's like $100 just going outside. You know, you, all right, I would say outside, but now when you have like Instacart, DoorDash, all those other things, you know, Netflix, it, even if you stay home, it's oh. so expensive, right? I, like how many, I have no idea how many subscriptions I have on for cable stuff, right? I, it's crazy. I mean, it's, it's, you get bills all over the place. Yeah. that is, And that's like a big thing now, people complaining about having all these different subscription service it's almost like we're paying for cable again mm -hmm. and then yeah those fees for like grocery delivery or let's say i can order like a 17 dollar salad by the time i pay all the fees i'm paying more than 30 dollars for one salad that's nuts i saw on a tiktok this this young lady was saying i just spent 20 dollars for a chipotle bowl yeah it, like how is a salad 17 like what is it little gold droppings in your salad chris like how is it 17 dollars? and how is it like 20 dollars for like for like a burrito bowl because then you're paying for like the delivery fee yeah. a service charge the tip but then like the delivery fee as well and then if you like want to keep your your cost under so you're like i'm going to order something cheap then you get like an additional price for like falling under a certain amount like if it's like under ten dollars and there's like a charge for for being the minimum now what do you think of this like kevin o'leary the guy from shark tank mr wonderful yeah you know he got a lot of attention when he was chastising millennials a, while, a little while back saying like stop with your avocado toast and you'll may you'll be rich and a millionaire i is that i don't know doesn't that seem a little tone deaf and a little weird that okay if you cut out all your avocado toast you're all of a sudden become a millionaire because like you're mentioning it 17 dollars for a salad you know 20 dollars for a chipotle bowl i mean everything just costs a lot yeah, even for Everything. like a, a box of K-cups, it, it runs from like 24 to like $32 just for me to make coffee at home. For like, <laughs> yeah. And the K-cups are not so good. I, By the way, I turned to get one of those old school uh, coffee pots. It's and so it, funny, yeah. funny that you said that because my mom has been complaining that her coffee isn't strong enough. Mm -hmm. So I bought her an old school coffee pot because she said the same thing. Yes. I was sick and tired of getting, I would have to drink so much coffee because it's not strong enough. Now I get it really, because now you can make it the way you want it. And I put less water in and more, you know, coffee grinds. Yeah. And, oh, it works. It's so much better. So that's, much better. That's so funny. She literally said the same thing. And that's why for Christmas in a couple of days, she'll be getting a coffee pot. <laughs> you and your, me and your mom, man, we're on the same wavelength. <laughs> Yeah. So, all right. So like cutting out, all right. Do you feel if you cut out the uh, avocado toast, the $17 salad and the $20 Chipotle, is that going to help you become a millionaire or, or like, this is just like, it's, it, it's not going to make a dent. Really. It doesn't dent. And I, I think people have even like done like, um, they've like crunched the numbers and stuff mm -hmm. and it really does not make a dent because every everything is so expensive groceries because then sometimes you buy groceries so that you don't eat out but then you're spending like i'm one person and it could drive me up almost like 200 dollars for groceries if it's like one of the weeks where i'm like running out of everything so I, one of the chores I do is like, I, I do this, I do sh shopping. I like that. I, I did that. I started when I was a kid and, you know, my parents would give my brother and I different chores to do. 
One would be like, I take my grandma to the library and she get those books with the, have you ever seen it with the big letters? Cause her eyesight wasn't so great and yeah. also do the shopping for her. So I got used to doing that. And I'll, so I'll do the shopping. And when I go lately, when I go to the cashier and I see the price, I look at the price and then I look at the cashier and I go, oh my God, this is crazy. And it's always the same reaction. They look at me, go, oh. they shake their head. I know this is terrible because, you know, cashiers, how much money are you making, you know, at ShopRite or Kings or one of those places, you're probably making just minimum wage. And then if you have like $150, $200 and you pull up, you know, put in your bag, that's not a lot of food. And that's a lot of money. So even, even, so we're talking about like the luxury items of a Chipotle or a $17 salad, but just to get the basics, you know, potatoes, milk, oranges, whatever, it's so expensive. And then usually, I'll, cause I like chatting people up. So the cashier will be, you know, telling, you know, his or her story about how, how you know, it's tough financially and how everybody else who's coming into the store says the same exact thing and they're frustrated. And then some people are very angry because they think this is not possible that it's costing so much that maybe you made a mistake and, you, and you're ripping us off. And it's, it's, it's a really frightening thing to a certain degree, right? Chris, like, it's never like this in my, in my recollection. Yeah. And I think that's why we see such like an over-reliance on credit cards and mm -hmm. why we billion dollars for the first time, uh, credit card debt on record. So yeah, I was thinking about that. Okay. So you have record high trillion dollar credit card debt. Um, and you have people tapping into their retirement plans. So initially, I thought, wow, that's not good. You know, that's scary that they have to subsidize their lives by by maxing out all their cards and then by by rating their retirement plans and they're not going to have something in the future. But now I'm starting to think a little bit. Do you think maybe maybe that's more of an optimistic thing that the people feel? that they're millionaires in waiting and they don't mind pulling money from their retirement funds and using a lot of credit cards that, because they feel somehow, some way they're going to make a lot of money and be a millionaire. So they're more optimistic. I don't know that that is definitely an optimistic outlook. <laughs> I think a lot of people are also just like revenge spending. And then mm. even wrote about how people are spending money on like once in a lifetime, just like opportunities, whether it's like going to see Taylor Swift or Beyonce or taking certain trips, because, you know, you never know when the next Black Swan event is going to happen. Yeah, that's true. You know, it, it, and with, with Taylor, Taylor Swift, and you don't have to be a Taylor Swift fan to know this, she like boosted the whole U.S. economy. She's carrying a big chunk of the U.S. spending because wherever she would go, whatever stadium is packed. You know, buying stuff, buying merchandise, staying over at hotels, renting cars. I mean, how wild is that? Yeah, I think her first, her tour was it maybe the first to reach like a billion a dollars. Billion. You know, and then between her, Beyonce, and then they say even the Barbie movie, like those three things propped up the economy this year. So wild. So wild. And this goes back to when we were talking about you know, how you could be a millionaire one through being an actor, actress, a uh, singer, rock star, and crazy. So, you know, I can, I don't know. Would you call her a country singer now? No, now more like just a pop star pop, or. Yeah. So pop. a pop star, not, not only a millionaire, but a billionaire with a B and, and still young. <laughs> it still has years ahead of her. Right. Yeah. It's very rare for a musician to, like become a billionaire just off of music alone because it's not like she has like all these products like there's no perfume line at least I don't think so whereas a lot of celebrities will come out with like their own lines in addition mm. to what they're doing within the industry so a parent's better off having their you know little Janie and John and say okay you're starting music lessons right now or football or <laughs> or basketball that's it Screw school, hell with it. Who needs it? 
just if you devote all your time to 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 either music or sports, we're going to bet on that. And, we, and that's and you're going to be a multimillionaire and then take care of your parents when you get older. Do you think that's a maybe maybe that's a better way of doing things? Maybe maybe the stage mom is is the way to go. Because... Right? Like they're so lambasted, but maybe look at Kim Kardashian's mom, right? Made them like yeah. billionaires or multi, definitely multimillionaires, right? Yeah, because I feel like at this point, we a lot of people were maybe telling the kids to go into like coding and whatnot, mm -hmm. but with tech layoffs, it's like, is anything safe? Is anything future proof? Yeah, it's 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 hard because it's shifts, right? It's like, you know, yeah, I'm a coder now, that's great, and then all of a sudden you have AI, you worry, okay, is AI going to eventually say, hey, you don't need a human coder, we're going to do it for you, and then yeah. what? Then okay, you got to be an AI prompter. Then what's next? I guess adaptability is the key where it's almost like you just can't say, I'm I'm doing X. This is my career and that's it. It's almost as if you got in your mind to say, even though my career is doing such and such, chances are in the next three to five years, I might have to change different types of careers and retool myself and reinvent myself and, and become something different. Because if I don't, I'm just going to fall to the wayside. Yeah, that's a good point. Adaptability and and resilience and then even a lot of like these startup entrepreneurs they failed so many times before they had an idea that like went through full fruition and and made them millions to billions of dollars you know i'm glad you brought that up because i think a lot of people feel that to be a millionaire multimillionaire plus is that you know you know you come from very you come from wealth you're a nepo baby things of that nature. But it does seem like uh, there's a lot of people who just grind it out. who just keep grinding and finding ways. And when Chris, when you were talking about, um, you know, what happens with failure, I was really surprised when I started interviewing a lot of you know, senior level execs uh, for Forbes and on the Blind Ambition podcast, you know, very senior level tech execs they were so open about their failures. And I remember growing up, people wouldn't talk about failures. That was like taboo. Same way you didn't talk about money. No one would want to admit, hey, I failed at such and such. But they would kind of bring it front and center. I remember this is one guy, Sean Kim from Kajabi, one of, one of the first few you know tech guys who I interviewed. And, uh, and he led with talking about a bunch of you know, several failures. And I was really flabbergasted. Like, wait, I'm I'm kind of interviewing for this pod um, for the podcast. I would think you would just be, you know, promoting yourself and saying, "Hey, look how great I am! How wonderful!" And he was very nonchalant and very practical. Saying, "No, this is how it is. You know, you, you start something, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. You iterate, you fail, you scrap it, learn from those mistakes, learn from the what happened, get better at it, try again. Maybe you succeed, maybe you fail, and so forth." And that's, I think, a lot of people, we don't we don't talk about this enough. They feel that the people who are successful, it's like a straight line up and there's no like ups and downs. They just feel like, okay, they're blessed and boom, it just goes right up. But it, from speaking to, at this point, literally hundreds, hundreds. And if you include from recruiting thousands of people, they, they it, it's, it's, it's not like a straight ride. It's up, down, up, down, up, down. Um, I can't tell you, let's say, so the people who I place on Wall Street, generally, let's say on average, they would get from, uh, let's say, 100 to 500,000 plus. That was kind of maybe my the sweet spot, what I would recruit for. And these people, you know, it's it's not as if they did that automatically. You know, they would work two, three, four years, and then boom, oh no, dot-com implosion. Work a little bit more, oh no, financial crisis, lost my job. In another job. Oh no, pandemic! Lost my job. So it's not, well, you know, it's not an easy ride. It's I think to get to millionaire status, you have to, you know, try, fail, learn, try again, fail, learn, keep going, not letting it stop you, keep moving forward, keep moving forward, fail. You know, it's one of those things where where most people just assume, hey, this was an easy, straight up ride. It's messy. It's messy and heartaching and, and probably and, and and you don't get there easily. 
and I loved hearing more of like the more humble side to it, especially within a, within tech, because mm -hmm. those guys can be very like braggadocious when it comes to like their total compensation. So I always appreciate hearing like a more humbled story coming out of tech. But you touched upon um, resilience and adaptability. What other characteristics make up a millionaire or like a highly successful person? You know, first of all, one of the things that's interesting, there's this book, The Millionaire Next Door. And if I remember correctly, a lot of what it is, is that you'll see the person who is in your neighborhood who drives the same truck that he or she had for five, 10 years, their house is modest, they're not going on crazy extravagant um, uh, vacations, they're not throwing off the chart parties, they're just very grounded. They're, they're grounded, they're, they're, they're family focused, they're work focused, they're business focused, and they don't get caught up in the trappings of, of what success is. You know, they don't get caught up with, I got to keep up with the Joneses. And, and, if, and, and people who live in certain areas, and you could appreciate this, whether it's in the suburbs of Connecticut or New Jersey or in uh, Park Slope, or, 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 you know, this, we're living in the brownstones in Brooklyn Heights, you get this kind of competitive thing where your neighbor is doing, you know, bought this new, I don't know, Tesla high end or this new BMW or whatever car is cool at the you know, time. And now you feel, oh, I got to do the same thing. Or they have this summer home in the Hamptons, Hamptons or in the shore. And now you got to do it too. So I think of what happens a lot of people, we talked, you know, at the beginning saying, hey, about the salads and the chipotle and the avocado, but this is now big money. You know, when you start, hey, I'm going to now have this summer home in the Hamptons and I'm going to have the place in Brooklyn Heights. And then maybe I have another place somewhere else. Now you're paying three different mortgages. And now when we're talking about, when we're talking about wealth, now you have these liabilities. Now you have to pay off all these mortgages. And anyone who's ever owned a home knows that there's always work to do. There's constant, the roof leaks. Something happened with the bathroom. Something happened with the, you know, the basement. There's always work, always money that's going out. So that now you're paying for the two or three or four cars. You're paying for the au pair. You're paying for the nanny. You're paying for the three mortgages. And before you know it, you're, you're, you're not really a millionaire anymore. Maybe, maybe you're making two, three, four, five hundred thousand a year. But when you start deducting all these costs, it's not so good. So you have like this group that are dead. They live modestly. They don't have like over the top conspicuous, you know, you know, lifestyles like going crazy. Um, they live in regular, you know, environments. They're frugal. You know, they're, they're, they're going to, you know, maybe they're not bringing coupons to the supermarket, but they're not going to get involved with what's the latest fad that I have to wear this shirt, this pants, this, whatever. Uh, they're practical. Um, they also level up through investments. So I think a lot of the, not think, but from the data, a lot of the wealth comes from investing and it doesn't mean when I say investing, meaning that you're a hedge fund guru or a private equity person, it's just someone who's being smart about their money. Instead of pissing it away on stupid shit, they're putting it into an S&P index fund. They're putting it into diversified ETFs, diversified mutual funds, and, and holding on, not chasing you know, meme stocks, losing money, chasing another meme stock, losing money, chasing crazy crypto plays that blow up. Now- some people can succeed because if you're at the right place, right time and a stroke of luck, yeah, you can make a lot of money hitting that right stock, that right meme stock, uh, that, that new crypto. But most of these people, as Chris, you asked, what they do is just very prudent instead of you know, just, just squandering your money saying, hey, let me put it into a mutual fund, uh, ETF, some other financial products, be diversified because you don't know which one's going to work or which aren't. And then don't be a crazy active trader unless you have the skills for it. And even if you have the skills for it, that's tough to do. And this way, over time, it compounds and compounds. You have dividends reinvesting. You have the income from your bonds reinvesting. And, and you build that kind of wealth slowly but surely. But even that, it's ups and downs. 
because right now the market's been going up, but easily you could see something happen and like a, like a Django thing and you pull that, so something pulls a little like one of those you know, things out and poosh, comes down 20, 30%. But that's why you also have to have a strong stomach to stay the long run. That's great advice. Another thing is just a lot of people have small businesses and do well and are able to, to make a lot of money. So there's a lot of, uh, as you mentioned, Chris, at the beginning, a lot of entrepreneurialism, you know, to, to figure out, carve out a niche, something that you're good at, something you enjoy and something that you can make a nice living at. And it's, it's really interesting because you think of the, like you said, like the big CEOs and executives and C-suiteers, but you can have just this very flying under the radar, random, you know, person who just, you know, crunching it day in, day out, day in, day out and doing really well. So sometimes if you could find the right, find the right business at the right time, you know, it, it all kicks in. Um, I think education helps. Um, I don't have the data on it, but I would be surprised that um, I should have looked this up, that I'd imagine uh, a good chunk of the millionaires um, are college grads or so, but you don't have to be, you know, I think my opinion moving forward, you're probably going to see parents saying to their kids, you know what, maybe you should go into the trades. Maybe you should look into maybe getting a skill like an electrician or what have you. And then if you have some entrepreneurial drive, you know, you start out, let's say as a plumber. And my grandfather was a plumber, by the way. And uh, you start as a plumber and then, you know, get a good business. Then maybe you buy out a competing, you know, plumber company next in the next town over. And then maybe you buy another one. And then before you know it, you have a little empire. So, so having... It's weird because we don't think in those terms. Like we think of like you have to be a venture capitalist, you have to raise money through top VCs, and you know you have to do you know those kind of things. But I gotta tell you, a lot of people under the radar are just just killing it and doing really well, and being very cautious, but ambitious and making things happen. I agree. I grew up you know, learning from my dad, he was a very successful blue collar guy. And it was mm -hmm. very unassuming, like how you talked about, and they always say like wealth whispers. I always love that quote. Oh, I did. So what, is, what does that mean? Wealth whispers. That's interesting. It, it touches upon what you mentioned before that wealth is often quiet, you know, mm. there's people who are walking around with like Balenciaga splattered all over their shirt. <laughs> stuff, yeah. You know? Is it someone who lives in a modest house or, um, yeah, it just isn't very showy. But I think that's what helps people get net worth because, for instance, when pre-COVID, when I would go to the office, I would have, you know, I would wear a nice suit, let's say a Brooks Brothers suit, the tie, the shirt, the whole thing, right? And it costs a lot of money. Now, I got to tell you, I'll I'll go to Old Navy, buy a t-shirt and jeans, and I'm way more comfortable, save a lot of money. And I don't care what people think. If they see, oh, here's this guy with a t-shirt and jeans, maybe uh, he's probably nothing. It doesn't bother me. I'd rather do that and save money because when you save money, and this is what's another thing for people who have a high net worth and who are millionaires, they, they become financially literate. Either they have advisors to help them or they figure out themselves how to be careful about spending money and how to keep your expenses low and how to keep your lifestyle and not have lifestyle creep where the more money you make, the more money you spend. And that's a big problem for people. You make a dollar and then you spend $2 because you think it's never going to end. And then all of a sudden, when you lose your job, it all comes tumbling down. So you have to be really smart about how you manage your money, how to make sure you're using it. Because the key to a lot of people to be wealthy is to have your money work for you. So if you're able to build up a nest egg and have, let's say, enough investments that you could live off the dividends, that's huge. That's huge. Now it's almost like you're getting a salary from your investments. But that takes time, patience, 
strong stomach, doing a lot of homework. And, and yeah. And I think we could even start teaching kids like these values very early on. Like I was fortunate enough, we're in school. They taught us financial mm -hmm. literacy. I was in fifth grade. We would buy the star ledger every day. We would pick a stock and we would track our stocks. It was, it was cool that I got to do that like as a little kid. So I, I would hope for more schools to implement financial literacy programs like from elementary through college. You know what? I, we didn't have that in my schools. I'm surprised. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and, and I don't know in like when my, I think with my kids, they had it in their program which, which is helpful. Even, even something, can I tell you something, even something as simple as teaching people about percentages. So when they give like something marked down, this is such and such percentage off. A lot of people don't know, like, well, how much is that off? What is that? And, and a lot of people are very financially illiterate, which is, which is not going to help to help you become a millionaire. Yeah. Or even just math illiterate. There was someone that went viral on Twitter where they were baking with their child and then they thought one over four meant one or four. So then they were mixing up the ingredient. They were doing like four tablespoons or of sugar and all that stuff. So kids, yeah, they're really struggling. I feel like when it comes to math. They're struggling so much. I saw some data today that not only here in the U S but across the world, post COVID standardized tests. Boom terrible you know i thought it would just be in the u.s but it's all over the world the scores are just just terrible and i'm not sure the reasons i don't i don't know if it's because over the you know covid period of time it screwed up everybody um i don't know what do you think about that like so what does that mean for the next generation i mean if they're if their scores I don't know. Like, I can't remember what test scores. It wasn't SATs because we're talking about younger, mm -hmm. but doing so disastrous. I'd be curious to know if scores spiked during COVID when kids were at home and their parents were helping them <laughs> on the standardized tests versus like three years later, where now when the kids are doing the tests on their own, I could definitely see scores plummeting. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's also because with if you're, if you're, if I, if I was a kid, right. If I was, mm -hmm. let's say 10, 11, 12, 13, whatever. And you have that phone in your hand and that's so powerful and you have your video games. It's so addictive that I wonder how much, when your parents think you're studying and doing your homework, you're just, you're playing video games with your buddies. You're on your phone, scrolling through social media and, and, and going through like TikTok. And what how, I, tell me if this makes sense. I think it rewires your brain that you just think in very short tidbits. And then when you come to taking a test, your mind explodes because you're used to just little bite-sized pieces of information. And now you got to concentrate on these long algebra and trigonometry problems and your head is exploding like, ah, this is too much. Yeah. And they get in their heads like, oh, I can't do this. And then definitely, even though like with some of the games, they are doing like real life math skills because let's say my nephew plays on Roblox, like he has Roblox money and then you kind of have to budget your money for the things that you want within the game and all the tools and the clothes. So it, maybe it's almost like you have to pose the word problems in a language that now resonates with them. So in other words, the test would have to be, so your Roblox character has a hundred dollars <laughs> And, and what do you need to do to get this? Yeah. And what job do you have to, I don't know if that, I don't know enough about robot, but what job do you have to take so you can make enough money to buy this, to get, you know, whatever thing you need to succeed in your Roblox adventures? Yeah. But I definitely think like the pandemic had a lot to do with it where maybe they didn't get the best education mm -hmm. from home. And then also, uh, like I saw it firsthand where parents were very, uh, hands-on when it came to schooling. So then now that the kids are on their own, I definitely could see a dip in their test scores. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Hey, what do you think? What do you want to hear a little bit about what goes on outside of the U.S.? Always. So, okay. So U.S., there's like 25 million plus people who are millionaires. That's That represents almost 
40% of all millionaires around the world. Right? Go USA. That's pretty cool, huh? Yeah, we're the leading yeah. the home of the most millionaires, right? Yeah. Right? I guess that's now, where the notion of like the American dream comes from. Yes, but do you think we need an asterisk next to it in the sense that um, let's say uh, 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 let's go back to the house, right? Like a million dollar house. Because is it really a million dollars or is it inflation? And that one day everyone wakes up and says, this is nuts. This house isn't worth $3 million. That's crazy. It's only worth such and such. And that inflation has just boosted up. So it's kind of artificial. Same thing with stocks and bonds and other securities. So that, yeah, right now, but your money really isn't worth the same because of inflation because it eats into it. So that million, is it really a million or not really? Because you can't buy the same amount what you did just a year or two or three years ago. Yeah, and I also wonder what the wealth transfer will look mm -hmm. like. You know, we've talked about this before where a lot of kids aren't gonna be better off than their parents. And then like, even just like mobility, uh, like income mobility, it's not really growing fast so then i just mm -hmm. wonder if there's certain trends that are happening now that will almost make the numbers lag in the future yeah i think what's going to happen is this is let's say everything remains sort of constant right nothing let's just put the equation nothing crazy on either side goes on is that if let's say the boomers when they retire they get older they pass away they're going to give their money to the millennials maybe gen xers uh, maybe their grandkids who are going to be the Gen Zs. So there's going to be this crazy amount of wealth transference where a lot of the younger generations are going to probably make out pretty well by inheriting all that money. But the caveat is sometimes if you live too long, you outlive your money and then the kids may be, and grandkids may be disappointed because there's nothing left. And what's 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 a challenge here in the U.S. is with the health system. You could have just one bad thing happen to you, and you you could have hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of dollars in debt now from like surgeries or cancer treatment, what have you. So, but on a positive thing, well, kind of positive that the money transference to millennials and and other groups is going to be huge. So you may end up having very wealthy millennials, Gen Xers. And then Gen Zers coming up. So they might have like a rescue. So even if the, the economy is tough, inflation, high rates and all that, but they'll get an infuse of money to keep going. But I think with the boomers, they're enjoying their lives. So I, I don't know if they're going to end up spending it all and saying, sorry, kids, you're on your own. Yeah, I feel like a lot more boomer parents, even Gen X parents are like, sorry, kid, you're on your own. <laughs> you're on your own. <laughs> Too bad. So, so yeah. Hey, hey, they're just gonna, so Canada, 2.2 million millionaires. The Netherlands, 1.1 million. Uh, New Zealand, 347. Singapore, 200, almost 300,000. Uh, so we're far ahead. Switzerland is 1.1 million millionaires so i don't know how to process that i don't know yeah. what like what what's happening here maybe is it is it, is it that our dollar is stronger so it's worth i don't know what what do you think i'd be curious to compare the data with like mm -hmm. the richest companies uh countries versus like the happiest and see if there's like a mm. core you know we've done that in the past we've wrote about like you know denmark the happiest country and finland the happiest country I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, New York and, and New Jersey and the U.S. lately pretty hard. I don't know if a lot of people are happy. That's why I think because I didn't hear you name those countries like on that list. So I think maybe when people aren't chasing after money, then they're just happier. I, and that's something you got to weigh too, right? Like you may decide, hey, I, I'd like to be a millionaire, but I enjoy, and then fill in the blank, you know, I enjoy going fishing. I enjoy going to the baseball games and it's a trade-off. 
I like, I'd rather spend more time with my family as opposed to be chasing the buck. So it's also depends on how you look at things and what makes you happy and what makes you motivated and get you out of bed in the morning. Yeah. Everyone has their own definition for what success means to them. And then also I think, especially like with Gen Z, they think to hoard a lot of money is immoral. So it'll be interesting to see um, how it is with that generation. Cause I feel like they're not as focused on getting rich. And then even if they are rich, I'd be curious to know in what ways that they mm-hmm. use the money and if they use it for good. Yeah. They definitely seem more socially conscious, politically mm-hmm. conscious, um, they want a better life work balance. So yeah, their priorities are very different. Yeah. I think, right. Than others. For sure. Like billionaires give them the ick. So <laughs> it'll be interesting. Yeah. All right, cool. So, so I think this is good. This is interesting because I, I feel that there's a lot of myths, a lot of misunderstandings about wealth and how to get there and who gets there. And I think some of the big takeaways to me, one of the biggest ones is what Chris mentioned is that a large cohort of people who are millionaires didn't come from wealthy family, they didn't come from rich parents, and they just grinded it out themselves, which which to me is really good. Because I know, you know we wrote an article fairly recently talking about maybe the American dream is kind of tarnished or, or, or taking a hit. So it is that that to me was a really nice thing to hear that there's still possibilities to you know pursue and, and, and have that American dream as, as it relates to money. You know, there's American dreams for other things as well, but as it relates to building up your own net worth and passing it down to generations. Uh, so that, that I think that's really cool. And also, also, it's good to know too, that it's not like, you know, get rich quick, that for people who want to get wealthy and people who are trying, they realize, hey, it's not just me. It's really hard to do. And, and you fail a lot and you screw up a lot. And you learn and you screw up more, but you learn and you try and you keep and you keep going forward. So those are the things I aren't I, I think aren't talked enough about. And they just feel like, oh, someone is just super lucky, right family, right place. But it's a lot of hustle, a lot of hard work, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of learning. And I, I think I think it should be talked a lot more so people can understand it. And and in a way, respect the folks who have put in that time and effort and accomplished things, but also respect that if that's not what you want to do is cool too. A- any parting thoughts, Christine? Yeah, the, this topic is kind of just like the culmination of everything that we talk about as far as like the advice that you give on like the growth mindset and mm-hmm. just how to be successful and even just things like working on your resume, all those things add up to this point to to either wealth or or just like person your own definition of like personal success absolutely and i think i like i like that what you just said because everyone's going to have their own way of looking at it because you may want to be a teacher and you get a lot of solace from helping young kids learn and grow and yes you might not be a millionaire but that meaning and value you have is, 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 is so important. And plus also the stability of having a job and not having to worry about like what we're seeing now with all these companies laying off people during the holiday period, you don't have to worry if you're a teacher, you know, you have that, you know, you're getting that salary, you know, you're getting benefits and you know, you're getting a pension. So yeah. So there are different ways of going about it. And then also, I guess not to also rely on just a paycheck and kind of diversify uh, your income and as well as like your savings. hundred percent. See, I think diversity is a big key because oftentimes people, you know, you could put all your eggs in one basket and be right. And just, just, just be a huge success, but that's rare. Uh, sometimes it, it, it's, it's maybe just brilliance. And a lot of times it's just luck. So to diversify, meaning put some in the bank in money markets in mutual funds, you have certain stocks, dividend stocks. So this way you diversify, something goes wrong, you don't lose everything. And then it doesn't hurt. Maybe you have a couple of gigs you're working on the side so that if something goes wrong and you're tapped on the shoulder by HR and you have to go in on a Friday afternoon and say, sorry, you're out of here. You have a couple of things in the works 
that you enjoy doing and making some money. And this could kind of get you through until you figure out what's next. Yeah, especially in this economic mm -hmm. environment, a little uh, distressing how many layoffs we're seeing pop up again. It almost feels like early 2022, end of 2021 again. So yeah, maybe we could do that for tomorrow, do a little bit of a deep dive into seeing like what the heck is going on here? Like we've seen e &Y, we've seen Hasbro, we've seen Cisco, Broadcom, Goldman, Citigroup, others either saying they laid off or planning to lay off. Really weird, really yeah. weird. So maybe we'll look into that, Chris, for tomorrow to see what the heck is going on here? Why Why yeah. is this happening? What, what, what do we not know? What do they know that we don't know? Yeah. It's very scary. Yeah. So this way, maybe we could give some advice to people to say, hey, all right, here's, this is happening. So let's, let's get prepared. Yeah. Well, everybody, thank you very much. Um, I hope, I hope, you know, this is different. You know, what, you know, I know a lot of people who are watching this are interested in maybe they're in between jobs, want to find a job, what have you. But I think it's also helpful to share just other types of information, um, you know, some that might be very direct, others might be just something to say, hey, I didn't know this is something I learned, something new, something different, something interesting. So I, I figured that'll make it, 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 you know, wanting to come back and hear different things so that you could kind of keep learning, adding to your skill, your skill set, adding to your toolbox and just growing and learning and being the best version of yourself. So thank you everybody for watching and taking the time out of your busy day. Thank you, Christine. And uh, we'll regroup tomorrow. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone.